So, so what I'm getting at is the things that we're measured by are not things that are things that heal people. Dr. Hampton, why are metabolic conditions increasing? Yeah, I, I call myself the metabolic health doc. I'm a family and obesity doc, and I, I really wanted to be a metabolic health versus a low carb keto or carnivore doc because I think metabolic disease is the root cause of most medical conditions. And to be honest with you, Dave, uh, you know, rather we're you know defining what that is in the first place. Uh, we're thinking about your belly size, your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and maybe your triglycerides and HDL. I just find that if we fix those five things, you know, and have a metabolically healthy society, then we won't have to worry about the numbers increasing. Now, for me, I live, you know, and work on the south side of Chicago. And in that environment, there's a ton of people who have what we call healthcare disparities, right? And I know COVID kind of helped to bring that to light. And, and we saw that, but we, we found that people who have economic issues, uh, people who live in neighborhoods where they can't ec exercise, people who uh, don't have the education to even understand the term metabolic health, right? People who live in food deserts, uh, people who are socially isolated, uh, those types of folk who don't have access to healthcare and suffer from those, they tend to have more uh, metabolic diseases. And to be honest with you, I think that because the disparities in healthcare are increasing, I think that that's why we have more metabolic disease. Now, having said that, there are other factors. Uh, there's the increased use of alcohol. A pandemic's gonna increase the use of alcohol and other drugs. There's more anxiety and depression. And I, and I recently read, Dave, that there was a, the suicide rate has, is much higher than it had been in years. So there are more people who are depressed. And if you're depressed, your sugar is going to be higher. Your blood pressure is going to be higher. You're probably going to gain weight. And then, of course, everybody is, you know, eating processed foods. So when you're eating processed foods, you're more likely to be uh, unhealthy from a metabolic perspective. So if we can shift our health systems, and I'm in a large health system, Advocate Health, to focusing on metabolic health, then we will address probably 70 or 80% of all the chronic medical conditions that people suffer from. So that's why I call myself the metabolic health doc. That's why I have a YouTube channel spreading this message. And that's why I appreciate even the work you're doing, Dave. So what was the point in your career that you realized this needed to be the focus? that you needed to really zero in on metabolic health? So for me, um, it started with my wife. Uh, she, uh, as an adult, developed uh, type 1 diabetes. And uh, when she developed type 1 diabetes, um, I was on a mission to help her uh, control her blood sugars. Now, in a traditional model, which is how I was trained, I was trained that you have to match the insulin with the uh, carbs and you can pretty much eat whatever you want as long as the, the insulin matches, right? And I later learned that that's not gonna work because it's very difficult to predict how many carbs are in the food that you uh, are eating. So if I, if I just Google uh, apple carbs, uh, it may say 25, but is it really 25? Is it 30 or 20? And now I'm gonna take insulin to match that. And if I'm giving too much insulin, I have a, a low sugar hypoglycemia. And if I don't give enough, I'm gonna have hyperglycemia. So, so after doing research on, well, who are, who's being successful for type one diabetes? And then I learned about Dr. Bernstein of the uh, Diabetes Solution. I learned about type one grit on Facebook, but more importantly, I learned of a study that was done by Dr. Eric Westman and Dykeman and others where the type one grit group were able to get their average A1C, I think they had 316 people in the study, to an average A1C of 5.6, which is considered normal. And the average A1C in uh, America for type one diabetics is in the 8.5 range. I also learned that if you're staying in the 8.5 range, you lose 12 years of life. So for me, once I realized that there are people on the planet who can actually uh, make that number normal for a type one and certainly reverse it for a type two, 
I knew that we had to move in that direction. So we were able to adopt a low carb diet. Uh, she went to basically keto, ketovore, and I continued to carnivore. And it's been a wonderful, uh, you know, kind of reality for us because now we know my wife doesn't have to lose 12 years of life. So I, I hope everybody who's a type one knows that there's hope. That's awesome. Um, and you just continued from there and and started to talk to patients about, you know, uh, if, if they're perhaps uh, they have diabetes type one or type two or they're, yeah. they're overweight, you were introducing the concept to them. Yeah, well, thankfully, uh, one of the things I try to do is uh, if I believe uh, in the science uh, and I can benefit too, let's try to experiment at home and then I can try it on my patients. So now having said that, when I started my journey, it was kind of funny because I was a, uh, a plant-based doc uh, for several years before I became a low carb slash keto carnivore doc. And let's just say 11 years ago is when that transition occurred. So, so when patients came to me and they were like, you know, you're talking about eating meat now. I think for some people there was relief, right? Because, you know, it's very difficult. And I know shout out to all the vegetarians and vegans, but for my patients, it's very difficult to do that well, if you're going to do it. And I think you can do it well if you take a lot of supplements and things like that. Now, having said that, there was also this like disbelief because when you are presenting a narrative that says red meat is okay and it's not going to cause heart disease and cancer, they're going to walk out of that office and hear a different narrative. So there's this disbelief and I'm really kind of always trying to sell this with science and data. But, but what I found is that when people were given a dietary pattern where they reduce carbs, most people found it easier to do that because when you reduce carbs, you're still able to eat the ribeye. You're still able to eat the ribs. You may not just use the barbecue sauce. So in other words, a lot of the foods that they already love, they can still eat as opposed to saying you have to eat a to tofu steak, <laughs> you can actually eat the steak. And as you can imagine, that doesn't taste as good, right? So so my my re, the, the reaction has been very positive in terms of the types of uh, joy people have when they uh, are able to uh, take the little challenge. Now, I know a lot of people in our community do challenges, the steak and butter gal and others. And what I find is that when you say, give me a month, give me three months. And what happens is they come back and it's like a miracle. So they're very motivated once they see the, the great changes that occur. And, it's, and again, as a clinician, it's been wonderful to see. And you, you mentioned that this um, goes against um, everything that people have learned in the past, you know, especially the narrative really is plant-based these days. So I mean, percentage wise, what kind of pushback do you get from people? Like, so the, there's probably some people that are just like on board straight away, but yeah. how many would be like, no, there's just no way I can do this because it goes against everything I've been told. You will be surprised, Dave, that um, I don't get a lot of pushback. I'll, I'll be honest with you. Uh, some of it is because I've learned to incorporate kind of motivational interviewing into my practice. I kind of know what they're gonna like challenge. So a lot of times when I present my case, my argument, I'll give them some of the arguments ahead of time because I kind of know where they're gonna go. So part of it is that, but I think most of it is you build rapport with people. Uh, you say to them, it seems that what you've been doing up to this point hasn't worked. You, you give testimonials. I have a lot of testimonials of people doing really well. And what I find is that when you give those testimonials, that's really the key. In fact, I could argue one of the biggest testimonials is how it's transformed my practice, right? So my, my clinical practice was one of disease management, and it has become one of healing and disease reversal. Now, I don't always have to be the one selling that. Sometimes the salesperson is their relative who referred them to me. 
Sometimes the salesperson is a person who uh, they saw on one of my videos doing a testimonial. And they was like, hey, I saw you on, uh, you know, Dave's YouTube channel. And they come to me already kind of anticipating that. So, so for me, it is really uh, for them an opportunity to hear testimonials of getting off medicines when they were told. And today, uh, Dave, I've taken two people off medicines and some of these patients were told they would be on insulin for the rest of their lives. They're going to be on pills for the rest of their lives. And so when they finally get a, a, a doctor in front of them, they're saying, no, you don't have to be on medicine for the rest of your lives. And you don't have to take statins. And, you know, you don't, you can, you can do it a different way. That, that patient is like, they feel a sense of relief. And, and the other thing that I find is that, and this is more in the, in the space of, um, you know, once they do the experiment, they will, they'll do it, they'll do it for diabetes, but then they'll come to me and say, my headache that I used to have is gone. My stomach once bothered me, but I just hadn't noticed my stomach. That heartburn is gone. Um, my skin is clear. You know what, doc? I thought eating all that saturated fat was going to destroy my labs and my labs look better than they did when I was not eating the saturated fat at a high level. So, 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 so some of it is testimonials from others. Sometimes they just experience themselves. But, but since we've been doing this, uh, it's much easier to convince somebody to reduce carbs than it is to convince them to re to go on a low fat vegetarian or vegan diet. That's just been my experience. I think some of it is culture, and in the culture I'm serving in this community, meat's a big part of what drives their dinner plate. So I wouldn't want to take that away from them unless it was harmful. But guess what? It's not. So so for me and for them, we can enjoy all of those great foods without worrying about being harmed. So again, they're very much happy with the results that they're getting. That's awesome. Um, and I find this kind of discussion really, really interesting because, you know, we uh, anyone that's on this way of eating always finds themselves in a position where they, they're talking to someone and, and effectively trying to convince them of the benefits, whether they're trying to talk them into doing it or not. So it's, it's really interesting to hear the perspective. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so just on the, on the nuance of diet and um, that kind of thing, why is there so many doctors that, are still kind of, if you want to call it, keeping the party line, are still, you know, pushing the drugs and not really interested in the results of the, the nuanced results of the labs and stuff to actually say, look, the problem might be sugar or the problem might be processed food. The standards that define a good doctor, particularly in the United States, is based on, they call them HEDIS measures. And those HEDIS measures focus on quality of care. Advocate Health is one of the top quality organizations in the country where I work. And we are as effective at this as Mayo Clinic, Cleveland Clinic, et cetera. You may know those other names better because they do a little bit more research. So when you're publishing, you get more attention. So, if I am defined by having somebody on the statin, if I'm defined by making sure a person had a foot exam, if they have diabetes, if I'm defined by making sure they get a referral to the ophthalmologist, those things are not things that heal people. Those are just things that have been shown to show benefit. If I give them a medicine like Jardius, which tells you to urinate out more, glucose, then I'm considered a good doctor, although that medicine only reduces your A1C by 0.6 to 0.8, not even a full point. Oh, by the way, increase your risk for urine infection. Oh, by the way, it's not really the best diet if you're doing keto or carnivore because it increases your risk, risk for something called glycemic uh, acidosis. So, so, so what I'm getting at is the things that we're measured by are not things that are things that heal people. Now, if I was measured by 
my ability to get people off medicine, then I would focus on that. In fact, the way healthcare works in America, which is appropriate to a certain extent, is that we get paid more money the sicker a patient is. Now, that's good if you have a lot of sick patients and you should be compensated for the time it takes to take care of those patients, then giving you more resources resources to maybe build things that su support that, right? But wouldn't it also make sense to compensate a doctor who had a person on insulin, they're not on insulin, or they, they were on that Jardis, now they're not on that. So there may be a way to do both where you say, we're still going to pay people for sick patients because you got to, you know, until they're not sick, you need to be compensated. But how about we reward doctors who take people off medicine? I know some countries do that, but that's been the issue. So doctors focus on what they're being told to focus on and, and what the insurers are going to pay you to focus on. So until we change the system, uh, and we're going to continue to do that gradually. I think my health system is really trying to do that. That's why I'm in a health system because I'm trying to change it. If we do that, then we have a path to not only, uh, you know, change how we practice and change from disease management to healing and reversal, but the patients will finally be in front of people who understand what healing looks like. And they don't have to resort to me and you on YouTube to find that answer. I want health systems to do this work as well. That's really interesting. It puts it in a bit more perspective for me and, and it helps me to understand that this is not just from the patient patient results side, but also from the doctor's side. It's actually, a, it is a nuanced discussion. Yeah, and it's more complicated than I share, trust me. <laughs> with, with all those complications, what do you think the future is like for a low carbohydrate style of diet? Well, I'll, I'll kind of frame it through the lens of a health system. Um, I think, let me just say that health systems, again, have to follow the recommendations, right? So if we're being asked to follow standards of care, which are those guidelines, well, we have good news because the American Diabetes Association now endorses low carb as a dietary option. The uh, Association of Clinical Endocrinology in the US endorses low carb as a dietary option. The American Heart Association now endorses low carb and keto as a dietary option. And I always re remind people that when the American Heart Association did it, they also said that with keto, you have to be careful because it's so effective, you need to have oversight. So we need doctors who know how to who know how to de-prescribe in order for us to do a good job in that sense. So so I think because organizations are moving towards that model, I think that eventually it'll just be at least a dietary option. We're not asking everybody to be low carb, keto, or carnivore. We're just saying we need to make sure it's a dietary option. The other reason why I feel that the future is bright is because we have people like yourself and I and Carrie of the Homestead How YouTube channel making a documentary about carnivore. And what I think that's going to do is at least expose more people to this idea that an animal-based diet is okay. But more importantly, if we're going to have different dietary patterns, we need to have uh, people out there messaging why they think the other dietary pattern is okay. So if we only if we go to Netflix and we only have the Blue Zones documentary, which is suggesting by Dan Butner that you have to have a plant based diet to be health, healthy and have longevity, which I've done videos to debunk that, by the way, because they do eat a lot of pork in these places. But if we don't have balance, then the, then the average person is going to assume that that's the way to heal. So we need more people on social media. There's never going to be enough YouTube channels and podcasts. We need the organizations to look at the science for what it is and honor it. And, 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 and as we continue to have this grassroots efforts with patients having the courage to go to their doctor with resources, maybe 
you know, I did a video with A. Day Fox, who is known as the Black Carnivore. And and it was like breaking news, the American Heart Association endorses low carb. So in the notes to that video, anybody could print, print that document that's from the American Heart Association that endorses this diet. So they can then hand that to their doc and say, doc, I know that's not your thing, but there appears to be large organizations endorsing it, which you walk with me as I attempt to do this dietary pattern. So that's kind of the world I want to live in where we're collaborative. We work together. And if I don't know what you're asking me to know, I take the time to research it and find out because I shouldn't have to go to YouTube to get the answer. So we love YouTube. We like the Dr. Bergs and Dr. Uh, you know, Eric Westman's of the world, but we should be able to get this information from our clinician. Yeah. Um, and ultimately we should all be able to have that kind of balanced discussion and get that information out there because we all really face the same enemy, which is process ultra processed food, right? You better know it, man. Processed <laughs> food is the enemy. <laughs> and, uh, and it's really important that people understand uh, that, uh, you know, when I started my journey, it was actually fun because you can do all kinds of magic with keto, right? There's, there's clean, there's kind of a clean keto and there's a dirty keto, right? And, 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 and I think I, I want to frame that in a certain way. So, so if I eat an avocado, nuts and seeds, that's pretty clean, healthy fats, butter, you know, uh, olive oil, coconut oil, but then you have this, this, this dirty keto. And if I eat like a seed oil, it may not in theory raise my sugar a lot. It may cause some inflammation, but it may, I may do okay. So, so the question is, is that okay to eat? Is it okay to eat uh, dirty keto where you're okay with artificial sweeteners and those seed oils and, and all these processed foods? And the answer is, yeah, I can go get a, a keto tortilla, or but but is that really the best way to eat? And I just think that as we transition from our standard American diet and in other countries, any standard diet, it's okay to maybe transition with the keto bread in the beginning because you're transitioning. And the key, if the keto bread doesn't raise your blood sugar, that's more important than the fact that it's processed bread. But then we get to the next level where, okay, I'm gonna clean my diet up even more. And it may be better in that case to say, well, let me just stop making or purchasing this keto bread. Maybe I'll do a, a protein sparing bread like uh, Maria Emmerich's, that's a little cleaner. Or maybe I just don't eat bread at all. So the key is there's levels to this. And I think that my problem with processed foods or dirty keto and again, it's okay as we transition, is I may get triggered by that. So I may eat a product that is delicious, tastes just like cake, is almond flour, is pure monk fruit, but my brain only remembers that that cake that was made with sugar and made with uh, wheat flour. So am I really doing myself any favors? Because what happens is it's going to trigger you. And it's going to make you want that. I don't, when I, when I'm at the end of my uh, last piece of ribeye, if you, you'd almost have to put a gun to my head to make me eat another piece of ribeye. When I'm full, I don't want any more. But there are certain foods that fit into this other category <laughs> that you're going to never stop wanting to eat. It's like going to the theater and uh, they say you can get refillable popcorn and you keep refilling it because you never, your satiety hormones, your leptin, that hormone that tells you you're full, it just doesn't get triggered with these foods. So I think in general, anybody who's trying to be healthy should only, for the most part, use keto processed foods as they transition away from the uh, standard American diet. And if you're able to tolerate those things without being triggered, then you can maybe have your indulgence days, like for Thanksgiving or Christmas. That's okay for the right person, but I find that many people are not right to do that. So so clean your diet up, eat real foods. And if you eat real whole foods, you're probably going to land in a good place. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah, that uh, that kind of underscores why Pringles' slogan, once you pop, you can't stop. Ooh. It's, it's a, much more catchy than Shh, your leptin will never know. You got that. <laughs> well, yeah, good point. I don't think that'll sell. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, I think I think they know what they're doing. I think Nina Teichos, who wrote The Big Fat Surprise, her research suggests that the people who were working for the tobacco industry, started working for the food industry. And their only job was to say, how can we make this food item as addictive as possible for profit reasons? So, so if you think they're doing it for your health, that's just wrong. And, you know, I, and I remember I, I really did like Pringles. Shout out to the Pringles folk. But listen, I, they were just it's something about that crisp, thin chip that just made you want more. And you never felt full. You always wanted more. And that's not how we want to live. Mm. So um, recently there's been a rise in the use of drugs like o Ozempic and Wigovi. Um, is that going to just keep increasing? And do you think there's ever a place for this kind of drug? Like Dr. Eric Westman, I'm board certified in obesity medicine. So when you're in your training, you learn that you should have all the tools in your toolkit. So rather it's medicines that we take by mouth, like Phentermine, or the uh, GLP-1s like Ozempic, Majari, or even bariatric surgery, you want to have all the tools in your toolkit. There's a big however in all caps, right? And if I'm a doctor who specializes in obesity medicine, and metabolic health, and I don't use a lot of Ozempic, that should be telling you something. I have found that we're doing a human experiment with this drug and all the others, in the, and they're actually working on new drugs that are even more uh, you know, effective at making you uh, lose weight. So when you hear about side effects like nausea and, and like vomiting, uh, you know, headache, upset stomach. You should expect that. That doesn't surprise people. But I'm going to tell you something. When I'm talking to patients and we're contrasting like low-carb keto or carnivore to a medicine that increases your risk for thyroid tumors, a medicine that increases your risk for pancreatitis, a medicine that increases your risk for suicidal thoughts and attempts, which is insane. A medicine, which one of the side effects is what we call ozempic face. And basically, it just means you get more sagging skin and wrinkles. We know it slows gastric emptying, which is why you feel full. But it also, we have lawsuits out there about intestinal obstruction because it just stops working, your, your intestines. And But the one thing that really caught my attention is half the weight loss on ozempic is muscle, not just fat. So we need muscle, and why would I then take a drug that may help me lose weight, but now my muscles have, uh, you know, I'm on the verge of sarcopenia. So, so for me, I, I, I will use Ozempic in my toolkit if somebody's really gave an a honest attempt at low-carb keto or carnivore with coaching and support, dealing with processed food addictions and all those barriers. And then we'll attempt it and I'll share all those risks. That's why I know it so easily. And then and, and then we'll go from there. But the goal is if you do that, 70, 80 percent of the people who take that drug will gain the weight back when they stop it. So I don't know if I want to be on a drug that costs a thousand dollars a month. And when I stop it, it come my weight comes back. But if you stop the drug and you're on a keto or carnivore diet, then the weight probably won't come back. So I think the key is. To you have to do the dietary change regardless of using these medicines. So that's the long answer to your question. The short answer is that they're going to remain popular for a while. <laughs> so on a on a personal level, um, how does so your carnivore? So how does the carnivore diet work for you? How often are you eating, and what what's the a regular day for you? And, and let me just say this, um, I'm still shocked that I'm carnivore, but my belly is very happy that I'm carnivore. So I'm very, 
my dietary pattern is uh, fairly simple. In my house, it's more of a ketovore household. Uh, I have had ketovore days. If my wife looks at me with a sad face and she slaves over something, particularly if it's something that's not known to irritate me, right? Or the irritation is at a level where I can tolerate it. So I, so I'm just like a lot of carnivores. I definitely tend to like more ruminant animals. So I'm a big, you know, uh, lamb and beef guy. But I'm totally okay uh, with chicken. I'm, I'm totally okay with pork. And seafood doesn't fill me up as much. So I actually take a daily omega three. But I absolutely love seafood. I just have to eat a sufficient amount. I try to throw in some organs. I'm a huge uh, you know, eggs. I, I don't have any issues with eggs. And then to the extent I can, I do try to use the uh, beef tallow and, 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 and lard and stuff like that to cook with uh, the ghee, which is clarified butter. So, so for me, most days, like today, for example, um, today I had for lunch, it was a, a half of a roasted chicken. And for dinner tonight, I'm going to have ribeye. And so I tend to eat like a, uh, I'm not even sure how big it is, but I'll eat a ribeye. And then I know my wife's not going to eat all of her ribeye. So I'll, I'll try to stuff. So I'll eat her half she didn't eat until I get sick of looking at it. So, but I, I, I tend to eat like that. Very simple. Uh, and, but I will make, you know, Maria Embrick has like a carnivore lasagna. So I will, on a weekend, we try to mix it up a little bit. I drink broths a lot during the day water. If I, I don't drink coffee regularly, uh, I particularly do it when I'm tired because I don't drink coffee regularly. Uh, it won't irritate my stomach, but if I do it sparingly, I can do that. Plus it feels more impactful. <laughs> As you know, if you haven't had coffee for a couple of weeks, you're going to feel it. So, so that's kind of how I do it. It's simple. I use the air fryer a ton and I tell you cooking and shopping have become so easy. I literally walk into a, a Walmart or a Sam's because we tend to shop there. My wife's a Walmart pharmacist and we just go straight to the like meat and the vegetables and uh, and she'll do her vegetable thing. I'll do my meat thing. I usually hang around the meat and I'll pick all the meat. She'll hang around the vegetables for herself. And that's pretty much it. So it's much easier. I generally don't go into the owls unless we need some type of se excuse me, seasoning. I do eat canned salmon. I do eat canned sardines. I kind of keep those at work as my go-to when I don't have other things. So it's been it's been real easy. And because I like meat, it's real easy. It's, I really enjoy it. And I never feel um, like I'm missing out. But the, the thing I like about it the most is that I never really feel hungry. So even as we're uh, hanging out recording this towards the end of the day, I know I'll be eating later, but I won't sit in front of the plate hungry. I'll just be eating because it's time to eat. Nice. So how how would you recommend someone get started with this way of eating? Yeah, I think the key is to, you know, keep things simple, right? Because if you um, if you make it complicated, then it's going to be complicated. So when I'm talking to patients, I do have a a link tree. So they can just search my name, Dr. Tony Hampton link tree. And I have a two pager. Now the link tree is more low carb, but when I tell patients, no matter what diet they're adopting, I tell them, you know, particularly if they're doing, cause a lot of my patients are doing keto or uh, low carb. What, you know, what, are, what meats do you like? And can you eat those meats without barbecue sauce, cornmeal, or flour? Here's a list of vegetables that are low in, in carbs. Which vegetables do you like? Can you just eat uh, one piece of, you know, your meat? And maybe you don't even have to have two sides, just one side. And and that's basically what I tell patients. If they if if they do that and they struggle, sometimes I refer them to the diet doctor website. I do have a, a kind of relationship with them, and they can get recipes. I recently interviewed the ketogenic woman. I would say, hey, here's a, here's a great channel that that talks about recipes, and now she's a uh, transition from the ketogenic woman to the carnivore woman, right? Because she's carnivore. But she, so a lot of her recipes are carnivore. So, and then, and then if the person in front of me is struggling, again, I'll give them processed food addiction recommendations like Dr. Joan Iflin, who has the Reset Community. 
Uh, I'll talk about the steak and butter gang that has groups that they can join and others. So I just look at the person in front of me, try to keep it simple. And then if they need a little bit more than that, then we'll kind of play it by ear. But most people do really well with a handout and particularly if they have a handout in coaching. We have pharmacists here also, and the pharmacists can kind of walk with them as they're kind of being de-prescribed medicines and things like that. Nice. So on that point, could you talk a little bit uh, about your YouTube channel and other ways that people can reach out to you? Yeah, I think um, beyond the link tree, which probably has a link to everything, I, I'm really trying to um, encourage people to use the YouTube as a kind of background noise. So when you're driving and you're you know, needing to hear a great testimonial, because a lot of what we need is inspiration, which is why I love your channel. I particularly love the fact that you entertain us with dressing up sometimes, which I appreciate. <laughs> And I do, and, and I love that because my, my 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 wife is an actress. She's a pharmacist, but her side thing is acting. And I just think that engaging people and speaking to them in simple language is so important. So for me, it's more about the uh, YouTube channel and the podcast is clearly audio as well. And I would just use that link tree because that's that's where it's at. And again, we're just trying to build a community of support so that people know that there are other people like them who have healed, who have struggled, and who also need support. So we have to kind of support each other. And if, if we do that, I think five years from now, we'll be in a much better place. And 10 years from now, we'll be in even, uh, either, even further down the line. So that's why I really think that I was called to do this work. We're busy. We Most of us have day jobs. But if we don't take the time to put this message out, somebody uh, will not do well. I just had a relative who recently uh, has succumbed to a stroke. And, you know, if you're 70, one, two, three, you shouldn't be having a stroke. And, and I just think that these types of recommendations, because again, it's the blood vessels. It's the blood vessels that get inflamed and the carbs lead to too much insulin and the insulin causes constriction of the blood vessels. And you don't make the nitric oxide and the calcium comes in and causes constriction and the inflammation comes in and the salt gets absorbed. All of these things affect your blood vessels, which are all over your body, except in a few places. Therefore, it's the root cause of most diseases. So, so if we can use these platforms to help spread that message, have people connect the dots between their symptoms and what I just shared, then they'll feel better about the decisions. They'll, they won't look at pasta as food. They'll see it as flour or the bread that they're eating. They'll just, they won't see it as food anymore. And once we get to that point, the healing will begin. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on and share your insights with us, Dr. Hampton. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you too. And I, I do want to do a shout out to you again for being on my uh, channel as well. I look forward to putting that out there and I just thank you for the work you're doing as well.